right, good morning, everyone. Good day to you, Joe. Thanks for coming. But um, I hope you guys had a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And um, now we're back at it again, looking for some high probability trading opportunities in the market. And um, of course, as some of you guys know, it's a holiday in Europe. It's a banking holiday. So, um, of course, um, you know, uh, uh, there wasn't really too much activity during the European session. Um, but, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to look to see if we can find some setups in the market. And I know um, thus far there really hasn't been too much going on. So it's kind of hard to find um, setups, especially on a one hour chart. Now, if you're scalping, you can definitely find opportunities on a smaller five minute time frame or one minute time frame. But uh, when it comes to the one hour time frame, looking for those um, day trading type setups, um, it could be quite difficult identifying those. So I really don't have too much to show you as of, um, you know, the day trading opportunities. But what we're going to do, we're going to look at a few pairs and we're going to see if there's opportunities to take advantage of a particular move. And the first pair we're looking at right now is the US dollar Japanese yen and we're currently looking at the one hour chart and it's pretty obvious the bias is to the upside order flow on the one hour chart is to the upside so we should be looking to buy that's what we should be looking to do we should be looking for opportunities to buy US dollar Japanese yen now the question is when do we buy um, well we typically want to buy at support and we'll talk about that later but for now let's see if there's directional confluence let's see if multiple time frames support a bias to the upside we can see that um, one hour order flows to the upside we have higher high higher low higher high so the one hour order flows to the upside so we should be looking to buy but let's go to the four hour how does the four hour look four hour looks very bullish as well order flow still to the upside um, and what about the daily let's do the daily order flow still to the upside bullish environment on the daily so <clears throat> of course we only want to look for buy opportunities that's the side of the market we want to be on we want to look for opportunities to buy US dollar Japanese yen and if you look at this chart right now, we can see that price reacted to this 20 simple moving average line or this 20 hour moving average line, which coincides with this area where we see these wicks here. So um, let's drop down to the 15 minute. What do we see here on a smaller time frame? All right. So, yeah, this is the 15 minute chart of um, US dollar, Japanese yen. Yeah, yeah. Good morning. Uh, well, hello, Bridget. Good day to you. I know it's um, not the morning over there, but um, but yeah, thanks for coming. All right. So right now we're looking at the U.S. dollar Japanese yen. And there's a possibility we could see price um, push to the upside. The reason why is because for starters, it looks like we have a three way pullback where we have a leg A, a leg B and a leg C and now price is pushing to the upside so it appears as if we do have <clears throat> what could be a bullish um, move but <clears throat> before we even decide to get in I need to see price break and close above this level right here this will be our break entry level and we need to see price break and close above this level before we decide to buy and I would like to see a break above and a pullback like price break above and then we can get a pullback to retest this area and then look for a buy that's what I would like to see on US dollar Japanese yen but you can see here that also price broke above this descending trend line so you know it broke above this descending trend line and is testing this structure area right here so you know we'll see we'll see if we can get that break and close above this level right here which is at 136.846 that's the level that price is at at the moment and you know once we see that then we could be more you know a little bit more confident that buyers should step in but 
you know, sometimes, you know, the market does what it wants to do. You know, you follow the rules and um, it could do something that you weren't expecting. Like, for instance, it could go tag these highs and then come all the way back and reverse on us. So, you know, that could happen as well. But um, what we're going to do, we're just going to stick to a plan and we're just going to look for a buy opportunity, you know, as soon as price breaks this level. And um, we'll probably have a floating position or if you don't want to have a floating position then you can um, you could target of course based on um, the Fibonacci of the pullback you take the trend based Fibonacci extension tool start at the low go from the low all the way up to the high which is the origin of this correction or the end of that impulse all the way back to this area again and then you could just target the um, you know the 127 just to play it safe but yeah, yeah, that's U.S. dollar Japanese. Yeah, now I think Marvin he has something he wants to share. Yeah, I just kind of want to briefly touch on this particular pair, U.S. dollar Japanese yen, because um, I kind of mentioned it last night when I wrote to the group. I kind of posted a chart of the price action and kind of showed how um, ever since the open we saw it break to the upside. We saw a continuation of that yen weakness as a result of what happened on last Friday when the Bank of Japan decided to keep to their ultra loose, ultra accommodative monetary policy by keeping interest rates still in negative territory. Out of all the banks and major central banks around the world, the Bank of Japan has been the one that hasn't pretty much turned hawkish or tightened. Um, they haven't lifted rates um, above, you know, net into positive territory. So um, it's interesting that despite all that we see that's happening in Japan, despite what we see happening across the world, that the Bank of Japan is still, you know, holding on, st you know, standing pat and just saying, you know what, we're going to still keep interest rates in negative territory at ze negative 0.1%. But um, I wanted to point out a few reasons for that. Well, for one, it could be simply it could simply mean that the Bank of Japan it could be privy to a possible breakdown in global demand or in the global economy. And um, you know, I'll touch on a little bit of that later on. And that could be the reason why they're choosing to keep rates low, because for the world, even though we have the US dollar as the world's reserve currency, the Japanese yen is sort of like the world's safe haven currency or the currency that's likely preferred during times when there's a collapse or a breakdown or there's fear or there's anxiety. So then they want that low negative yield in order to sort of uh, stay loose uh, to, to serve as that, but also simply because, uh, you know, they, they, they're more of an importing economy. They don't really manufacture that many goods. So in order to keep their products cheap, you know, they would rather prefer to have a negative yield on their, their currency. But, um, yeah, we see the U.S. dollar Japanese yen, you know, at the moment moving up. Um, you could see that during most of Europe, you could see that since the um, European session or the beginning of the European session, we saw it sort of sell off. We saw that relief. We saw the Japanese yen strengthen. And this could be simply due to uh, the fact that during Europe, we didn't really see too much activity simply because, like Melvin said, it's, it's a banking holiday. It's sort of like an international holiday across the world uh, with sort of like the global Labor Day. And most workers were away from their trading desk. Uh, so then we saw this pullback during Europe, but right now we're seeing this uh, continuation of this rotation higher. So then we may see the U.S. dollar Japanese yen continue its extension to the upside um, along with other yen crosses. They may also be extending to the upside on this news of yen weakness due to Bank of Japan monetary policy, but also U.S. dollar strength as we expect the Fed to hike rates by 25 basis points on Wednesday. So then this is what's actually underpending the U.S. dollar Japanese yen. So just like Melvin said, we're going to wait for a break and close of this support up here to confirm the support of this resistance to confirm, you know, bullish rotation in this particular pair. And, if, and then you will be looking for an opportunity to buy upon a pullback. <clears throat> And um, if you want, you can hold out this trade up to when you get to um, these, these extension zones up here around a 127 um, Fibonacci extension area. But, um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to point that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So then what we're going to do, we're just going to simply wait for that to happen. But um, one thing I wanted mm -hmm. to point out is that there's no guarantee like 
for one, when it comes to Elliott waves and measuring these waves, um, you know, people see things differently. And, you know, something that you or someone else may be seeing is this, is that they can see this as, this is leg A to me, leg A. This could be leg B. And we're seeing leg C now. Or, or, or we haven't seen it, but we will see it soon. Some people could measure it like that. You know, so then that's the reason why, you know, when it comes to these things, all you could do is just use good risk management. Do the best you can to identify where you feel um, leg A is and leg B is and leg C. I know it sounds kind of strange and it's like a level of ambiguity with it, like, you know, some level of confusion with it. But, um, yeah, like nothing like in this world of trading, nothing's so perfect. Um you know, with price action, how price moves is not as obvious as you would want it to be. Like, if I had it my way, I would make it look so clean, the three-way pullback. But sometimes it's a little bit murky and it's not as clean or obvious as you would think. So um, we could actually see price push down and even attack these lows down here. And if that is the case, then how do we do that? So then we look. For, you know, we could say, okay, price could give us a measure move pullback. So you take that leg A right here, what could be leg A, and then you can extend it right there. And um, you can also do this, where take this right here. And... Um, Measure the from the zero to the three eight two, and that takes you right back into this low again, this area right here where we could potentially see the buyer <laughs> step in at. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, just we're just gonna have this here just in case, but um, price could very well turn around from where it's at and break this area right here. So, you know, we just want to have everything in place first. You know, before we decide how we want to execute, but, but yeah, this is what we're looking at right now on the Aussie. I mean, U.S. dollar, Japanese yen. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad that you know Melvin pointed that out um, because you know even with trading, like we don't you don't know, always know how or the path that a particular currency or a financial instrument would take. Um, you know, in their move or within their trend. So this could very well be the beginning of a leg C. Uh, lower in anticipation for uh, more upside in this particular pair. But, uh, you know, that's the reason why we wait for confirmation. We wait for confirmation. So, like, we would rather wait for price to confirm that the bulls are controlled by a break above that structure, but, you know, in order to buy. We won't buy yet until we see some type of break of structure. But just like Melvin said, we haven't seen uh, a significant three wave pullback. Um, on this particular time frame, or, or you could say only one hour um, into the zone. So then, um, you know, it's just good to exercise patience and use yeah. patience. And this is why trading has to be more like an if-then statement. Like, you want to have, you know, sort of like a plan A and a plan B, and sometimes a plan C. In this case, you know, we're waiting. It, it could either break to the upside and we'll get in on a pullback, or it can pull lower and complete that leg C. In either case, we're going to be prepared for both plans. So then you can't be static or rigid with your trading. You have to be dynamic and fluid. You have to be willing to adjust to whatever price gives you at that particular moment. Yeah, what I was going to say is that trading is not, like how you analyze it, and it says it's not really perfect because even if we did wait for a break and close, it doesn't mean that yeah. price is going to continue. Yeah. That could still be leg B. Like that's what I'm saying. Like we could get a leg B. Like this could be potentially leg A. We can get a leg B that actually breaks and closes. And you're thinking this is what you wanted to see the bullish confirmation. And then all of a sudden you get a leg C and it stops you out. You know, so then that's the thing. Like, it's not perfect, but that's why you use good money management and risk management, you know, to account for the ambiguity, the uncertainty with how price is moving. And if you wanted to, you could look at other tools, like look at the equally weighted indexes, look at the dollar index. Like, do you see that type of price action on the dollar? Do you see a three-way pullback or something confirming 
on the US dollar. Like these are things that you can look at as well, or even a Japanese yen index. Um, look at those to help you to determine is this where the rotation is is beginning? Because those can actually help you out as well. The equally weighted indexes. So, you know, um, yeah, that's just one thing I wanted to share. Yeah. Right. And you can also, you know, look at, you know, US Treasury yields. You remember, like we said before, there's a strong positive correlation between U.S. two-year, 10-year treasury yields with the U.S. dollar Japanese yen. So then there's multiple ways you can figure out, okay, like, is this the right decision? Am I on the right side of the market? Sometimes you're on the right side of the market, but it's just simply your timing of when you step in to execute that trade. So it's not that you're wrong. It's just that maybe you mistimed the right moment to enter that trade or enter that buy. So then, just like Bevel said, really the key to trading and being a successful trader with uh, longevity in trading is to use good risk management and money management. Don't risk it all up front in the beginning. Just make sure you, you know, exercise self-control, go in small, and then you can scale up if the price further confirms to you that, um, you know, the bulls are taking over or that this particular asset or currency pair will go in a, the direction that you planned for or you expect it to go. So, yeah. Yeah. So we see here, it looks like price may want to break and close above it. So, um, you know, you can just prepare for a potential, you know, setup or opportunity. And um, let me look. Let me do one more thing. Um, yeah, I know uh, we got this first public bank. I'm pretty sure Mars is going to talk about that later. Um, but um, let me do something right quick. Let me. Uh, see what's happening with the dollar on 15 minute okay so we see the dollar is somewhat in a consolidation type phase um, right here and um, Japanese yen index okay so yeah the Japanese yen index looks like it wants to um, continue to sell off but um, even for this one right here we could see price actually correct a little bit um, after we get this break so that's the reason why um, you know I wanted to show that because oftentimes they can give you a, an idea of what could be happening but um, it's kinda hard to read and know exactly how the US dollar Japanese yen is gonna move so you know if you want to you can just sit on your hands for this one and um, you know, just not not participate. But if you do decide to buy on this break, then enter with a smaller position, and then just see if you can get in and reload on a pullback in price. Yeah, and you know, I like to add, like on days when the volume is lower than no normal or liquidity conditions are lower, just like for today, um, you may not get those perfect technical setups like with the three wave pullback and the violation of structure because liquidity is low we don't have the normal concentration of buyers and sellers in the market that we typically do that creates the the three wave structure that creates these breakouts and pullbacks and support and resistance that you know we typically see in normal price action so then we got to keep that in mind as well so just like melvin said if you want to you can stay out of it but also on days like today when liquidity is low, you may have to just risk, get some skin in the game, risk small, uh, considering that volumes aren't at, you know, their normal levels at the moment. And then just, you know, hope that your bias and your analysis will play out. But, um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to add that in. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. But um, in the meanwhile, if we did decide to enter this upon a break, um, how would we place our stop? Like where would our stop loss be? Um, that's an important question to really to really answer. And um, you know, you could do it a number of ways. But um, for one, you could say, hey, you know, if I do decide to get in at this break or right around here, um, and let's say I wanted to target the one two seven area right around here, then you could say, okay, what makes sense to me, risk, you know, risk wise. So um, you can just drag your stop here and and um, yeah, yeah. What you would do, yeah. I know Marvin's shaking his head in the background, but what you would do, you'll just wait for a break and pull back 
and then a deeper correction. You know, because you're more like when, whenever you trade these setups on a one hour chart, you know, you're not going to like for scalping you're, it's OK with one to one risk reward. But, you know, in this case, you'll wait for the break and close above and then a deeper correction to some area of structure, likely right around here. Let me just draw that in. Now I'll just draw in the structure area because you could see it to some degree right around here. So then you'll just wait for price to come somewhere within this zone or this area before you decide to um, initiate the order. So again, if we get a break, you can wait for something like this and then target this area right here. And then, um, yeah, maybe shoot for something like a one to five reward to risk. But what we need to do, we need to see a break of this level first. A break. And then it pull back down into this area of structure. Look left. Structure leaves clues. And then um, and then um, look for a buy. So yeah, that's what we'll be looking for for um, this pair. So again, break, pull back, and then boom. All right. So yeah. All right. Okay, I know Little Boots asked, was in a go buy and got out and it took off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that stuff like that happens. Like the minute you get out and close out, all of a sudden that's when the trade actually takes off. And it's like they understand the psychology of the traders. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I get it. It could be frustrating. But, um, all right. So, yeah. So then, um, of course, we'll just sit here and then just wait for this to happen. Um, I know Bridget said I was in silver and also closed out too, too early. Yeah. Yeah, that happens. It happens a lot. <laughs> but, yeah. All right. Let me um, add a price alert here just in case we do get this break and close above. Let me just add that right here. Crossing up, once per bar close. And today is a new month, guys. It's May 1st. And break and close above. Look to buy on for back. All right. So again, we'll be waiting for price to retrace to this zone, and then that's when we'll look for a, a potential buy opportunity and um, target this area right here. So, all right, are there any questions? Going once, going twice. All right. Yeah. Could be. Yeah, but um, all right. So I guess what we can do now is go to our next pair, which is um. Also a yin pair, and this one actually is a little bit more bullish, I believe. But uh, let's go there right now. Let's do the Aussie yin, A-U-D-J-P-Y. Yep. So, so yeah, for this one right here, we're definitely seeing the bulls come in and push price up. I think we could be um, somewhat late, but, you know, typically, even for these setups, I don't know if I would have got in anyways, because like for me, I always want to get in around an area where I know there's structure or some support. Like it didn't even get to this 20 simple moving average line. Um, so like I know for me, I probably would have avoided um, this buy, you know, um, even though we see price going up right now. But typically I want to see price get to, let's say, like this indecision candle right here that I'm about to highlight right there that indecision candle right here right around here this zone that's where i would like to go because that's where i know uh, one hour demand may be located so of course we didn't get that because momentum is pretty strong to the upside and it seemed like yeah it seemed like price came down to this area where we had th these anchor points right around here 
and uh, push higher. Actually, I'm going to start doing more tests on um, Aussie yen, and there's a reason why. Um, there's a reason why. I think I mentioned it um, to some of you guys um, before, but um, but yeah, you can see the price came right down to this level and then popped up. But yeah, let's see how this looks in a 15 minute or even smaller time frame, because I think this move is primarily due to the yen selling off. When we looked at the yen index, it was you know really selling off. So, um, all right. So then from here, we see that price did break this level right here. So, but we get, we got the break right here, but yeah, what we could be seeing is this, um, price pushed up, formed this double top. And then we had a breakdown. This could be leg A, leg B, leg C. And, um, price broke the high right here with no pullback just like marvin mentioned sometimes you won't see that during low liquidity times you won't get the pullback that you're looking for and um price actually just kept expanding higher um that's why lately i've been entering even upon the breaks like those that's been with us for a while you you know how before i used to get in on a pullback after a breakout i wait for a pullback and then try to get in but lately um, you know, quite a number of times it doesn't happen and you could be waiting for a setup for a while and, um, you never get involved because you're waiting for that breakout and pullback to happen. So, um, yeah, during days like today, you may not get that, but let's say that we do want to get in. Well, um, price never provided a pullback. So what you could do, you could wait for price to approach this area of structure right here, which is an area of demand as well. Uh, but based on a smaller time frame, you can wait for price to come to this zone or this area right now. Since we sort of see the three-way pullback already, price broke to the upside. Now we'll be waiting for price to come back here to this red hesitation candle area. And we'll look for a buy right around there. So again, uh, this is what we'll do. We'll wait for price to potentially come to us as testing the highs. We'll wait for price to come to us down here. And then from there, we'll look to buy and uh, ride this all the way up to our target, which um, in this case will likely be a 382 measure move. Or not a 382 measure move, but a 127 fib of the pullback. So we start at the end of that correction all the way up to the high, back down to um, right here again. And um, you know we'll just target the 127 or higher. But yeah, we'll be looking for this type of um, opportunity on Aussie Yen. So again, wait for price to pull back into this zone where we have some hidden demand right here with this hesitation candle. And then from there, look to buy on bullish confirmation. Let me um, actually put that icon right here. So we'll look to buy. We'll look to buy right around there. But um, But yeah. So, yeah, we'll see how this goes. But, you know, of course, price is testing an area of resistance or potential supply. So um, there's a possibility we may get a complete break and close below this area. But, you know, what we want to do is stick to a clear set of rules. Um, I'm looking at this on the 10 minute. Uh, let's see how this looks on the 15. OK, yeah, this is the 15 minute chart right here. But, yeah, I guess you can see the same area sort of structure, you know, right around here. So let me draw that in. So right around, yeah, right around here is fine. But yeah, so then yeah, we'll we would want for price to come to us, um, to come towards us, and then from there we'll look for a buy. So yeah, let me just add a price alert right around here. And what you could also do, you could just wait for bullish confirmation once price reaches into that zone. You can just wait for a price action candle to support um, a move to the upside, either a uh, bullish pin bar candle or some sort of bullish engulfing higher, high, higher close candle. But yeah, you can look for something like that before you get involved. If you want to play it safe. Testing. Uh, 15 minute. Zone. On. Trigger, look 
to buy and I'm gonna say on book confirm I may just wait for a price action candle or some if price does come into the zone wait for a like a price action candle or drop down to a smaller time frame and look for that that confirmation before you uh, before you get involved but yeah so yeah that's that so yeah we'll be looking for something like that to take place on Aussie yen so yeah are there any questions before we move on going once going twice okay I'm going to quickly do one more setup and um see how that goes so let's do pound USD but first let me um see how did the US dollar Japanese yen form um cause did we ever get a break or no because I didn't see no alert nope so the alert did not come on so yeah our sentiment could be correct we could see price come all the way back into this price reversal zone to yeah but yeah to complete leg C and if that is the case then um that's when we'll look for bearish bullish confirmation but um let me actually put an alert right here add alert and Let me say price testing minute PRZ area. Look to buy on fifteen minute confirm. All right. All right. So yeah, yep. So yeah, we'll see what happens. We'll be notified in either case. If you get a break to the upside, we'll be notified. If we see a continuation of this leg, potential leg C, we'll get a break to the upside. All right. So with that said, let's go back to the one hour chart and I want to look at one more setup. Um, pound USD. Okay. So yeah, this is pound USD, and we're currently looking at the one hour. And as you can see, really, for this pair, the overall order flow is really to the upside. That's why I'm a little bit hesitant on, on selling. But we can see that price gave us this nice correction to the downside. And, um, you know, I was going to look to sell, but I don't know yet. Like, I don't know right now. Like I may just sit on my hands on this one and not do anything uh, because if you look at it, the order flow is still to the upside. We still got bullish order flow on probably multiple time frames. You even go to the four hour chart. What do we see on the four hour bullish order flow to the upside and um, and then to the daily? What do we see? Uh, pretty much bullish order flow. But what may lead me to consider going short is the fact that we see price responding to this ascending trend line resistance right and it's almost forming like a um, ascending or rising flag or rising wedge type setup where we have um, price creating this support down here with this white line but then we have this resistance and it's creating almost like a rising wedge so whenever you see that that signs that price or momentum is weakening and we could potentially see a rotation soon. So, um, yeah, that's the reason why I was looking for a sell. But I don't know right now. Like, I don't know if I'm going to um, actually sell right now. But, um, but yeah, it looks like price may want to continue pushing higher to uh, retest the highs. Because the order flow is still to the upside. It's pretty obvious. So, you may still want to look for opportunities to buy, even for this particular um, pair. Um, okay, um, I know uh, Little Boots said caught the next move up off the pullback right into my um, PT um, price target, I think, or right into my um, PT, I think you mean, or TP, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, price target. Or, or, yeah, price target or take profit or whatever. But um, yeah, are you referring to gold or are you referring to pound USD? Um yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gold. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Good catch. Yep. Yeah. 
good catch. It looks like the dollar is weakening. So, you know, that could be the reason why that move. Yeah. Um, especially if you're scalping. Like if you're scalping, then you can take advantage of those small moves in price. And which today may be a better day to scap because when when there's not as much liquidity, you may not get a sustained move. But then so there there are days when there's not that much liquidity and you do. So it all well, depends. Yeah, that's you know, when there's you know, exaggerations, overshoots mm -hmm. in price because there's not that normal concentration of buyers and sellers. But um, just like Melvin said, with with gold, with some of the metals, we do see them pushing up to the upside after pretty much consolidating or not really moving too much during Asia and Europe. So then we're seeing that breakout trade form. And I think, we're, you know, we're seeing the same thing in silver as well. So then like, yeah, like, you know, that's good that you were able to catch it, um, catch that move. And it's Primarily due to some dollar weakness. We got some dollar weakness coming in right ahead of the U.S. Open or, you know, New York Open. So, yeah, just kind of wanted to share that. But, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, for this setup, um, I'm not going to do anything now. Um, I would rather look for a reversal on the 15, which is what we see right now. Uh, we see a reversal on the 15-minute chart. So, um, <clears throat> you know, if you want to. Or this could be a potential reversal, but if you want to, you can look for price to pull back and test this area, or this neckline area, um, if you want to. So again, um, if we were to draw this in, you have this indecision, this area of indecision right around here. You can just simply, you know, like right around here where the neckline is, you can simply wait for price to come to that area. And then uh, look for buyers to come in. It seems like price did that right here with this wick, came down, wicked this area, and then pushed back up pretty strong. So then you might have to sit on a smaller time frame. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know if you guys can see it. Like, if you, oops. Um, uh, let me uh, let me delete that. Let me delete this. Um, you know, if you just zoom into this area right here, you can see that um, price broke. This neckline area, but when it opened, it came down wick to this zone and then popped up. So then that could have been the time when the buyer stepped in. But yeah, retested this level and then we see this push to the upside. So um, I mean, hopefully we can get another opportunity to go back in. But um, you know, something like that's the thing when it comes to waiting for pullback, it's like catch twenty two. Um, it's great to wait for pullbacks. But sometimes you're going to miss out on quite a bit because price doesn't give you the correction you're looking for. So mm -hmm. um, you yeah. won't be involved. In yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, I was going to say even for this breakout, like like the more you trade, the more you'll, you'll notice that there are times when we don't get the pullback to where we know the buyers were previously. Um, because, you know, what makes this a good zone to buy is simply because it broke through resistance what was once resistance becomes support and we know that there's a lot of buying momentum at these levels to sort of create that impulse and that breakout to the upside so then you, you always it's always safe to buy where the buyers are or to buy wherever you see demand is on your chart so then that's the reason why you know it's more safer to wait for the pullback but just like I said sometimes you don't get it because the momentum after that breakout can be so strong so then it's up to you on how to trade. I know for those that are less aggressive and more conservative, they wait for the pullback because after every impulse, there has to be a correction at some point, even if it's hours later, even if it's, you know, minutes later, it varies depending on how strong that move is and how volatile that move is. But at some point, it's going to have to pause. It doesn't just keep going up in a straight line. It's going to have to uncoil, unwind and pull back at some point. So then for those that are more conservative traders, they have to exercise a lot of patience and self-discipline with their trading. But if you are aggressive and you know what's happening with the price action, you see it structurally, you see where resistance is, then you can enter in, scale in at a small price just to get a bit of that move and just say, OK, I'm only going to risk very small simply because it's not the best area to buy. But I still want to take advantage of this breakout. And you can do that. You're free to do that. Um, if you understand just the whole market structure, price behavior. So um, just like Mel always said, there's multiple ways to skin a cat. <laughs> there's multiple ways you can, you know, you can trade and be effective even as a breakout trader.
uh, even if you don't like waiting for pullbacks. But the preferred way or safest or the most risk averse way to trade is to sort of buy where the buyers are and sell where the sellers are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we see here a continue continuation of this expansion to the upside. And, um, you know, what you could do if you want to, you can see how far price could expand. You can take a fib extension of this move right here. And then you can measure to see, okay, where could price be heading? And we can see that price is, looks like it wants to break above that 161.8 um, level, which means that, um, yeah, this is a strong move to the upside. You know, we're testing structure to the to the right yeah, or to the left. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so then that's probably the move. Like this move is probably most likely due to dollar weakness, um, U.S. dollar weakness. But we do see um, some level of resistance or structure right around here. Hopefully this will hold. But, you know, there's no guarantee. But yeah, what I would like to see is a pullback, you know, to this area down here and then um, an opportunity to get involved. Um, let me do something. Um, I'm going to move this up a little bit higher because we do also have these wicks like from this from this candle right here. It created a nice wick rejection um, right around here. I don't know if you guys see it, but see this candle created this nice wick right here. And sometimes you can position your pullback trade based on that you know where buyers came in at historically you could say hey there's a possibility we could see this area retested right here and then um uh, yeah man. yeah and then look for the buyers to come in you know right around here which you know will move everything up but yeah this is where we could see you know potential buyers come in at just look at the wicks the wicks tell you where the buyers can come in at just like this last time you see this? How we see there's wicks right here. There's double wicks. Price pushed up and then came back. Where did it come back to? Right to the wicks. Right to the wicks to the left. Right to the wicks and popped up. So then, you know, look at stuff like that when you're planning your trades. Look to see where the wicks are. Wait for price to get to those areas where the wicks are because those areas could tell you where the buyers are in the market. So again, you know, if I'm looking to um, buy, I'll look to buy right around this area right here where the wicks are. And um, you can wait for a price action candle and all that good stuff. So then let me just place a price alert right here. So I'm just going to place a price alert, add alert. And I'm um, just going to say, we're just going to look to buy. Price testing uh, 15 minute structure support. Um, look to buy on bull confirm. All right. All right. So, yeah, we'll look to buy <clears throat> on bullish. Um, confirmation once price reaches this zone. So, yep, it's just a matter of just sitting on our hands and just waiting for price to come to us. We're not going to chase the trade. We're going to wait for the trade to come to us. All right. So, yeah, that's it. Um, let me see how the U.S. dollar Japanese yen is looking. Um, all right. Okay. Yeah, well, interesting. Price came to this zone. And now it looks like it wants to react to it, <laughs> but we didn't get the break that we wanted. And, um, yeah, this is where it can get kind of interesting because, you know, we want to stay true to a set of rules. You know, we would like to see price break and close above this high before we get involved. But, um, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to wait <clears throat> and not do anything. Um, let me see how the five minute looks. See, it's pushing up now. Yeah. See, we did get this break on the five minute right here. We saw it on the five minute. <clears throat> we didn't see it on the 15 minute. So, and this five minute break could have been a clue that things were shifting, but, um, I'm just going to hold off 
I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit on my hands for now and, and wait for price to give me more clarity. As a matter of fact, we may have to see price break this high right here. Now that I think about it. Yep. Like if it, if it could break this high, then we definitely know for certain that momentum is, is definitely shifting. So um, it's up to you. If price does break this high, let's say it breaks this high on a five minute and it closes above it, then if you want to, you can enter your buy as long as your stop is behind this swing low. So if it does break and close above this level on the five minute, then you can you know look to get in uh, and just enter immediately and just, just place your buy, um, you know, place your stop behind this this low right here. Um, if that makes sense. So, yeah. But, um, all right. Yeah. Yep. But, yeah, this is U.S. dollar, Japanese yen. You know, we'll definitely come back to that um, in the near future. And um, what else did we look at? Yep. Uh, we looked at Aussie yen as well. How's that looking? Yeah, that one just kept pushing up. <laughs> Then give us no opportunity whatsoever to come in and get involved. Yeah. So, yeah, this is one example where we would have loved to get in at this immediate break, but price kept expanding to the upside. So, we missed out on this one. Um, yeah, because yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think price is going to, well, it could pull all the way back, but if it pulls all the way back, then I'm not looking to buy um, because at that point it would break in validation, momentum could be shifting. And we could be seeing a rotation in price. But yeah, like this is just one setup that we missed out on. And it's a perfect example of what we've been talking about. Sometimes, a lot of times, you'll miss opportunities because you're waiting for a specific thing to happen. And um, it could be a pain because you, you've been waiting for this opportunity to happen for hours. And the minute it's time for you to execute, you're not able to execute because you're looking for certain things to happen first. So, you know, this is a part of trading. That's why it really helps you and your patience level, you know, as a, as a trader. Uh, it helps you to develop patience. And um, when it comes in life, like anything in life. But um, but yeah. So, yeah, we probably missed this one out. Missed this one. So then we can just delete all of this and then plan for the next setup. But yeah, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to pass the mic over to Marvin. And, um, and then we'll just take it from there. And um, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, let me do one more thing before I even do that. I want to go to the U.S. dollar Japanese yen because if price does break close above, um, what would our stop have to be? So then if you do do that, it would have to be at least an 18 or 19 pip stop, 18 or 19 pip stop. But um, but yeah, I just wanted to do that. But yeah, I want to pass the mic over to Marvin. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, welcome to a new month of trading. Um, this is the month of May, like you guys know. And normally this is the month where traditionally uh, we we say oh, there's this whole, you know, this old trading proverb, sell in May and go away. Um, because, um, of course, this is the month ahead of when we start seeing that summer malaise, summer volatility come in as the kids exit from school, they end the school year and as summer vacation season starts up, we typically see a breakdown or sort of like a slowdown in momentum and in, even in market conditions. But we may not get that this year. Um, simply because of all the dynamics that are sort of um, influencing price action at the moment and is behind, you know, most of the underlying moves in markets. We may not see that sell and may go away, that seasonal um, proverb play out. <clears throat> so, um, but yeah, so then we're in a new month of trading, but in this new month of trading, in this first week of trading, it's going to kick off to, you know, a strong start. And we already woke up to some important news um, this morning. We all woke up to the news about First Republic Bank um, actually assuming all of the deposits uh, or no, JP Morgan assuming all the deposits from First Republic Bank, which means that there will be no longer any FRC or First Republic Bank. It's going to all be JP Morgan. So then let's go to FRC <clears throat> real quick. 
and just see what's going on. And you can see right now that, you know, and it's actually much lower. It closed at $3.51 per share on last Friday. But where is it now? Where is it now in the pre-market? So in the pre-market, it's all the way down to $1.90. <clears throat> it's going to gap lower for today. But um, you can see this oppressive decline. It pretty much lost most of its value in like the past, what, three months, two or three months. This has just been such a strong tumble in this particular banking stock, um, this regional bank stock, which, of course, brought some of the earlier fears over uh, regional banks. But um, we see this impressive tumble ever since February uh, from the highs here all the way down <clears throat> to where it's only $1.90 per share. So then we know that it's going to be swallowed up by J.P. Morgan, I think. Um, you know, you can see here, um, you can read some of these articles later that J.P. Morgan Chase acquires substantial majority of assets and assumes certain liabilities of First Republic. Uh, <clears throat> J.P. Diamond or Jamie Diamond gets over financial crisis, laments. You know, of course, that's the major news that's going to pretty much motivate uh, most of the price movement as we move into the Wall Street Open. Everyone is waking up to this news, uh, First Republic Bank being bought by J.P. Morgan. And at some point, we knew that one of the big banks were going to step in because they were told by the FDIC to submit bids. They were kind of like ordered to say, all of you banks that we've sort of given... Um, you know, a pass to or we're giving unlimited cash to like your JP Morgans, your Wells Fargo, those big banks, like for all those banks, they're like, do something, come up with a bid for, you know, FRC, because we can't afford to allow this bank um, to fail or this bank to collapse because the reverberating effects of that. So then we did get that this morning. And in some way, we still see you know, the market sort of, how can I put it? Like, you know, we're seeing, <clears throat> excuse me, we're seeing somewhat of an impact in the regional bank sector. Let me just put this up real quick because there's two indexes that I want to show you guys. There's this, where there's FRC, and then there's um, KRE, which is the regional bank um, e ETF. Let me just do this real quick on the daily chart. And we can see that it kind of, you know, of course, you know, the, the pre-market prices is not, how can I put it, it's not as low or it's not gapping lower like um, FRC is, which leaves me to believe that this, inst this incident with FRC is just an isolated incident with just this bank alone. And we're not seeing that fear priced into some of the other uh, regional banks because we're seeing um, sort of like a liftoff. It's been sort of rallying for the past two days or closing positive for the past um, three sessions on last week. It filled this gap. So then th even though we're not out of the clear and even though this is clearly a downward move, if we see, we see this collapse and then, you know, lower highs and lower lows. But it seems as if this collapse is sort of easing off. We're seeing the momentum of this fall sort of steady and flatten off. So then we could very well see a recovery in the regional bank sector, but we will first have to see it at least violate these highs up here. But um, this news for First Republic Bank, is that impacting the Russell? Because you remember the Russell is one of the chief... Um, regional bank ETFs, the Russell 2000. So let's just go. You remember the Russell 2000 is with our small to mid cap, you know, banks, but let's see what's happening with the Russell. And let me just go to the daily chart here. And you can see that, um, you know, for the daily chart, um, you can see it's moving lower. It's currently negative uh, from its open, but it did gap to the upside. It's slightly below the closing price from last Friday. But um, it was trading negative. It, it fell lower on the back of this news about J.P. Morgan Chase buying, buying First Republic. There won't be any more First Republic. So then how is markets taking this news? And we can sort of, you know, take a quick glance at the, you know, futures market. Um, we can, let me just pull this up right here, ES1, and see what's happening with 
with future markets you can see here how like, most of them are flat around our opening levels let's do this real quick I know I'm <laughs> I had the wrong window but um we see the um, Dow E mini futures pretty much flat and then let's go to the Nasdaq and we see the Nasdaq E mini futures also trading around its opening level um, or you know last last week's closing uh, level so then we see that the markets aren't really moved by this news I think at some point we had already knew that some bank was going to step in and and buy First Republic because there's no way they're going to allow this bank to fail and then the reverberating impact of it especially when the Fed interest rate hikes are partly responsible for why um, these banks are under such stress so um, we see that that took place this morning, but um, also just like Melvin mentioned earlier, you know, we we in the midst of a holiday uh, globally, it's International Workers Day or International Labor Day. So then we're seeing some trading, you know, some traders away from the desk. So right now uh, we don't have a solid catalyst to sort of prove or show where um, the futures markets are going to go. Um, but I think the market could be waiting for some manufacturing PMI data to come out because that's pretty much um, the main indicator that's going to be released today. Uh, we would have had a lot of them during a European session, but the European docket was empty simply due to um, the holiday. But um, we did have some Chinese manufacturing PMI numbers that came out over the weekend that was quite disappointing because Chinese PMIs fell into contraction territory. So then let me just do this real quick. Let me just turn um, this off real quick. Uh, stop sharing for a little bit. And then I'm going to actually turn it on. Let's see. Because there's a few things we got to look at. Uh, for one, um, let me just do this. Let me just um, look at Forex Factory. I know we haven't went to Forex Factory in a while. You know, that's an economic calendar, but also a forum where you can, you know, just read, you know, what other people are saying about currencies and read articles. Board. Yeah, it's just a discussion portal discussion form but um i know we don't have it on here but let me just go back to sunday and see if we got that okay or saturday let's see that okay so yeah so on saturday um over the weekend we did get some manufacturing pmi numbers that came out and this is kind of what influenced some of the risk sentiment because we're seeing a breakdown in global demand um this manufacturing pmi coming in at 49.2 we did have the services PMI come in and it's in expansion territory but actually decelerated as well to 56.4 so could this be an indication that we could see global demand broadly slow down and could this be the first signs or leading indicator of possible recession um, in the latter half of this year or maybe towards the fourth quarter of this year we don't know but this is what weighed on sentiment um, upon the open this is what weighed on crude oil because if we're seeing manufacturing PMIs break down then that means that there's not as much demand for goods and manufacturing and could this simply mean that um, oil which is a strong component of production and and also some of our raw inputs like some of our base metals and industrial metals and raw goods that go into manufacturing could they also be selling off as well as we see uh, this uh, one of the chief manufacturers of the world um, China actually um, go into contraction territory so um, but it's not you know it's not that far below the 50 level you remember 50 and above is economic expansion or expansion in the manufacturing sector 50 and below is contract or below 50 is contraction so we're at 49 we're right there at that you know level where the contraction is taking place but it's not as pronounced as it could be but um but yeah so then we got this going on right now and for today um you know we did have some manufacturing pmis come out in japan but uh for today uh, the market 
you know, we didn't have any news during the European session, but uh, we are waiting for some U.S. docket news uh, with manufacturing PMIs from both the S&P Global and ISM manufacturing PMIs coming out. So then we're going to be carefully looking at uh, these reports just to get an idea of sentiment because we don't have anything to grab onto other than the FRC, the First Republic Bank news. What else could could we grab onto? What news could we grab onto to sort of influence uh, market sentiment or risk sentiment? So then I think we're going to be looking at the ISM. The ISM is more important than the S&P Global, but um, we're going to look at the ISM and, of course, right here um, based on analysts forecast they're expecting it to come in at 46.8 which is of course slightly better than 46.3 but not too much of a difference but um what we are going to be paying attention to is in this report is the prices component because this is an inflationary or inflation gauge we're going to see are we seeing a pickup in pricing pressures um are we seeing a softening or rotating in that in this pricing index and also we're going to be looking at the employment component of the manufacturing pmi report simply because this week is also the non-farms uh, u.s labor market week where we're going to see all of the u.s labor data the update on u.s labor come out on friday so then there's a lot this week a lot of risk events this week, uh, we have three central bank monetary policy meetings with the RBA um, tonight or later on in the Asian session, in the Asian morning. And um, the expectation is that we're not expecting the RBA to do anything. They may just hold rates um, in place simply because they see inflation rolling over. They see inflation rolling over and um, they may not want to... Uh, you know, creating, you know, how can I put it? Like, you know, there's already signs of slowing down in the Australian economy. So then they may feel like where there's already a huge backlog of rate hikes that are still waiting in the pipeline to impact inflation and to impact their economy. So then let's just hold off until we see those rate hikes, you know, come through and make their impact into their economy. But their monetary policy statement is going to come out this evening or in the Asian morning. And then we also have the Fed um, that's going to report their interest rate decision on Wednesday, followed by the ECB, which is going to report theirs on Thursday. So then this is going to be a heavy week where we got labor data. We have PMI data for both manufacturing and services sector. We have, you know, non-farms on Friday. It's just a lot going on this week. So, um, it, it's going to provide for some volatility um, after today. Today is sort of like a special day simply because it's a holiday. But on Tuesday, uh, moving throughout the rest of the week, we should see some volatility um, pick up and kick in as um, these um, reports start coming out. But um, but yeah, the RBA is tonight. So um, but yeah, let's see what's happening um, in earnings. Um, I know this is earnings season. We've already had about roughly 50 percent of US earnings already come out so let me just go to the Twitter right here you know uh, the internet is kinda of running kind of slow here but uh, let's go to earnings whisper right here and let's scroll down to see what is on the docket for this week's earning calendar. So yeah, so then this is pretty much a list of some of the companies, a good portion of the major companies and reports that will be coming out this week. And um, this morning we did have SoFi, um, Norwegian Cruise Line, those uh, particular companies come out. Um, I haven't had a chance to check on their earnings. Um, I may do that in a little bit, but then after the close, we have MGM Resorts, uh, micro strategy come out and then on tomorrow we have some of our you know big chip names so the first of the big chips which you know amd is coming out um on tomorrow after the close and then we also have pfizer um before the wall street open in the pre-market on tuesday but um like we've already had a good portion about 50 percent of the earnings um come out 
And so then we have a little bit more to go, but this is also going to play a part in sort of influencing market sentiment. So then if we do see solid data coming out, that may encourage some risk appetite, even though this could also be a sign that, you know, the Fed hasn't done enough either. So it's going to it's interesting to see how the market is going to interpret any type of strong performance in corporate data. Because you would think that the higher interest rates were way on earnings and way on profits. But we've only seen that a little bit. We haven't seen profits hurt too much across the across the board when it comes to these earnings. So then um, that's encouraged some risk appetite um, like, like we saw last week. But uh, we do have a Fed meeting this week. So then we may see some of that strong speculative buying and some of that risk sentiment kind of held in check for the time being until we get on the other side of the Fed statement. But we do have these earnings reports coming out this week. So then uh, for those of you guys that do trade stocks, options, um, you know, just pay attention for opportunities to enter in on um, these reports. So, yeah, but what did SoFi come out as? Let's see what their earnings were. Let's go down. Okay, they beat revenue. Estimate by 5.3%, beat guidance by 3.4%. Okay. So then um, they beat. They, they actually um, came in better and performed good on both the top line and the bottom line. So then, yeah, so then we've been getting that uh, for this uh, for this earnings season. Uh, we've been getting strong, you know, a solid performance in general. But just like I mentioned last week, a lot of companies in the sort of um, downgrading or undershooting their their targets for earnings and growth so that when the numbers come out uh, when they have to report it, it it may look like they've done so well and they overperformed and that would cause their stocks to rally so it's sort of like a, a form of trickery where they intentionally undershoot uh, with their guidance uh, for in previous earnings reports in order to sort of get a strong reaction from the market once um, they prove that they <laughs> beat beat their undershot levels, if that makes sense. So, um, but yeah, this is earnings season. We're in the midst of that, and that's going to influence the market. But um, for the most part, there's not much um, going on. Let me just go to FinViz for the sake of just, you know, doing it and going there. And, and I know the dollar is definitely selling off, you guys. The dollar is massively, well, the dollar is massively uh, selling off. And I think Bev's going to touch on that in a little bit. But uh, we see that, you know, U.S. futures is still kind of neutral. Um, you know, the, the, the Really, the futures heat map is sort of mixed. Uh, we're seeing crude oil still selling off um, as a result of lower demand, and uh, lower global demand, or, the, or them expecting... Um, you know, lower, lower demand for oil as manufacturing may slow down. Um, you know, we're seeing gold pick up, and that could be due to the U.S. dollar weakness that we're seeing at the moment. But, um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's let's see what's happening in the crypto space. Because um, I think if I haven't looked at that, the last time I checked, they were all trading high. But um, according to this heat map, there's pretty much neutral flat. Um, Bitcoin Cash and Ripple and Litecoin are the leaders, according to this spectrum. Um, if you look at other ones, it could be different. But um, the U.S. dollar is a weaker currency, or you could say it's weakening and it's selling off at the moment. And we should see something similar even in the Forex heat map, but we don't. We see the U.S. dollar pretty neutral, while the Aussie is the leader for today, followed by the Kiwi and the Swiss franc. Um, there's a reason for the Swiss franc um, being strong today simply because um, the market is pricing in a rate hike in June for the Swiss National Bank to hike rates for the Swiss franc uh, up to like 1.5 percent so then that's what futures curves are sort of pricing in for the Swiss franc so then that's the reason why it's a leader for today but in normal cases it would be you know trading along with the Japanese yen as a safe haven currency it should be you know down here but for today it's one of the leaders but um the weaker currency for today, or the weakest, is the Japanese yen. Um, just like I said, the Japanese yen is sort of selling off due to that yield differential, due to the Bank of Japan not pivoting or not, you know, wanting to hike rates at all and keep rates in negative territory for the Japanese yen currency. So then the Japanese yen, and then we just saw this switch um, 
be the Canadian dollar. The Canadian dollar could be selling off due to what we see with crude oil. You remember Canada is an oil producing economy. So then whatever happens with oil, if oil prices sell off, that could mean that the Canadian dollar would, could sell off as well. And then we got the pound as well, which is also somewhat tied to oil, but not that much. Um, there could be other reasons why, you know, the British pound is low and selling off, you know, at the moment. But, um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for the fundamental news. Um, it's a light day. So then in trade based on what you see with the technicals and we will be definitely later on this week touching on, um, the fed statement. Um, but for now, I'm just going to leave that for another time and pass the mic back over to Melvin so he can finish uh, the rest of today's webinar. Yeah, all right, <clears throat> guys. Yeah, I won't be with you for too long. Um, may keep it brief and short. Um, we may open the war room today and look for some um, scalping or, you know, some decent setups. So, um, but yeah, um, let me actually go back to the charts again. So, uh, let me this all right so um yeah yeah we're looking at the charts while we're here i might as well just stay with the nasdaq um because i definitely want to talk about that um the nasdaq right here this is the e-mini futures um you can do qqq nasdaq e-mini futures you can even do US 100 or NDQ um, so yeah let me just do it right here all right oops let me do this well I'll try something else um, let me just do US 100 and I'll just do currency.com all right and let me just delete all of this all right so all right so right now we're looking at US 100 right and we're looking at the daily time frame actually if you wanted to you could start at the weekly and um, you can just get a feel for what's been taking place and as you guys know um, price gave us this measured move to the upside on the weekly you had this move and um, it sort of gave it's not a complete one on one measure move, but it's sort of like a measure move uh, to the upside, maybe like a three eight two measure move. But we can see that price is responding to this area of structure to the left. Look left structure leaves clues. This very same area is an area of supply. So this is what this is where weekly supply is. But, you know, we can see that price is reacting to this zone and to this you know th this area right here plus we see stochastics is overbought on the weekly so we know that price may rotate soon it's, it's going to take days for it for that to happen but we could be in the middle of a possible slowdown or rotation in price and now going back to the daily time frame what we see here we see price has been consolidating right around here but lately we've been having some strong moves some strong bullish candle moves which means we could potentially see a bullish breakout of this level and we sort of did get get that on Friday however I don't really consider this a clear breakout this could be could be a false break and we could see selling pressure come in so then uh, what I'm going to do from here for one I'm just going to for starters identify this zone of consolidation so we have this area of support and then we have an, an area or zone of resistance right around here. And price could be channeling back and forth between those two zones. Let's go to the four hour though. Okay, so right now we're looking at the four hour chart and what we can see here is that it seems like price may want to slow down and rotate to test this zone right here. Um, so. I'm just going to draw in this particular zone of potential demand right here or, you know, structure. Uh, well, we can call this four hour demand. 
and there's a possibility that price may want to come down to this zone and then push higher before sliding lower again or it could just come down to this zone and push higher and uh, continue its expansion to the upside but um as far as what we think could happen based on these past few candles there's a possibility we may see a sell-off in the nasdaq maybe for the remainder of the day who knows but um what we want to do next we want to drop down to the one hour chart and see what's happening but um yeah also yeah yeah i wanted to point out also that you can see the last time price came into this area we saw topping on the four hour so you know every time it comes and tests this area we see topping on the four hour before price t touches this zone right here so what i'm expecting is topping again um, on the four hour but we may not get that price may continue to expand and break higher which means that hey we're definitely in an environment where the buyers are exceeding the sellers and we're in a bullish environment we need to look for buys but for the most part price is touching the zone there's a possibility we may see a deeper correction on the four hour if you go down to the one hour chart um, right here go down to the one hour we see what could appear to be a potential reversal taking place um, for those who are familiar, what do we typically call this when price comes up like this and we see a full 100% retracement? What is that typically called? For those who's been with us for a while, what do we typically call that? I'll give you guys a few seconds to maybe chime in. But, um, okay, so Naomi chimed in. She said a V top. Bridget said a V. And the both of you are correct. What we see right here is a V top. A V top, which means that price could correct higher and form what? Form a head and shoulders type setup. Right? Right? Yep. Adam, a head and shoulders setup. So then that is something that could potentially take place. However, um, just look to see where the order flow is. On this particular pair, Order flow is really still to the upside. Um, you know, we can see that even on the four hour chart a little bit better. Um, order flow is still bullish and it's still to the upside. So um, if we do decide to enter a short, we definitely have to be extra cautious. What I would do, I'll wait for price to correct. Maybe into the zone. Remember, look at the wicks because the wicks tell you where the sellers came in historically. And we can see that. In the same area on multiple occasions, price came to this zone, this area, and then we saw the sell-off. We saw the sell-off. So then look at the wicks. And the wicks tell you where the sellers are. So then right around this zone right here is where I think we could see some sellers come in at. Like right here, this whole entire zone right here is where the sellers can come in at. So I'm going to call this one hour supply. And... um what I would do is look for price to get to this zone before I look to look for sales. So um, we may see price bounce up, correct up into this area. And then from there, we'll look to sell on um, bearish confirmation. So again, wait for price to come to this area where the wicks are. You know, look left. We have wicks right here, wicks in this area, wicks right here. You know, you guys get the point. But um, come right into this zone into this area and then look for an opportunity to short on bearish confirmation and trade it down maybe to this area of demand right here or you can just be aggressive and hold out because I'm I'm thinking that price wants to make its way down here but like I said you never know so it's best is to be cautious and just at least take out if you don't take out the complete profit right around here, this area, at least take partial profit. But yeah, this is something that um, I'm potentially looking for on the NASDAQ. All right. So yeah, we'll be looking for eventual um, sales after a correction in price. Price may continue to want to sell off, but in either case, uh, we want to stay on the side. Of, uh, of bias so then if we do see price come up into this area then I need you to drop down to a smaller time frame and enter on bears confirmation 
So, you know, right in this zone, when price gets into the zone, drop down to like maybe the 15 minute, 10 minute, or at least the five minute. And then uh, look for that bearish confirmation before you decide to execute a sale. Because the order flow is still bullish and we could still see price expand up. So um, just be aware of that. But yeah, this is the NASDAQ. Are there any questions about the NASDAQ before we move on? Going once going twice all right and um, I'm going to do one more I'm going to do gold and we're going to call it a day and so let me do gold and then um, also guys I'll let you guys know you know when we decide to go get back into the room um, maybe around maybe 9 30 central yeah 9 30 central time 10 yeah 10 30 Eastern um, that's when you know we may decide to get in get into the room all right so right here we're looking at gold and we can see gold is still very much consolidating um you know it's still trapped within this range um, in this range between no no where you see these sideways moving candles on the daily um i'll zoom in so you guys can see that a little bit better but um well let me just zoom in so right around here we can see for consecutive days, price has been moving sideways. And it's just been trapped in a range. It's moving sideways. So we could see price test these highs and then slide back lower again. Yes. You know, there's that possibility. You know, so then, you know, of course, with gold, it's been an interesting asset to trade. But if you're trading on a smaller time frame, then you could um, sort of take advantage of um those swings in price those minor swings in price but in this case we do see buyers coming in we see nice wicks at you know to the downside these these nice wicks and um price seems like it wants to push higher but you never know so you know we'll see what happens but this is on the daily uh, let me zoom out and let me drop down to a smaller time frame like the four hour okay so let me Move this out right here and let's talk about what we see. As a matter of fact, let me clear this stuff out right here. And uh, what we can see here is that price is mainly trapped in a range. But we did have this nice, strong, strong volume candle right here. Nice, strong, bullish, engulfing volume candle, which could mean that things are shifting, but you know, we don't know. You know, there's no guarantees we could see the reversal. Price will literally have to break and close above this entire zone in order for us to know for certain if the bulls are taking control. So with gold, it's pretty interesting. But um, if you want to trade on a temporary side of momentum, then you'll look to buy. Look to buy gold on a pullback in price. Now, um, let me go to the one hour. So this is the one hour. Um, you definitely see price breaking this high right here. So then we definitely want to stay on the side of, of buying right now, <laughs> buying gold. So, um, it's only one hour. Let me go to the 15 minute. Okay. This is the 15 minute. And, um, what about the five minute? This is the five minute. So, um, yeah, the reason why I look at all these time frames is because, you know, you want to see if there's some level of hidden demand, you know, at all these time frames, because that can help you to decide how you want to trade this. So in this case, um, you know, we don't see anything recent right here on this nice move to the upside. We do see an area of demand down here, but um, this move was very parabolic. So then my assumption is that we should see some type of demand maybe where the um, 20 hour moving averages or something like that but but yeah so yeah in this case um yeah we'll be looking to looking to buy um looking to buy gold look, look for opportunities to buy the pullback and the dip in price so yeah um yeah i would probably maybe this area maybe um Look for opportunities to buy. 
because we don't see anything to the left until price gets to this area. So price may want to come right down to this zone before we actually, you know, get what we want to look for. So again, let me make sure. Okay, yeah, that's visible. So going back to the one hour. Okay, this could be a particular zone that we could wait for price to approach. So yeah, we'll see what happens. But anyways, that's it for today. Thank you guys so much for coming to today's session we really do appreciate you guys i'll let you guys know when we enter the room i'll post something in the private chat but um i hope you guys got something out of today's session and and like we always say at the end of every single meeting remember to always count your blessings not your pips and we will definitely definitely um see you guys soon you guys have a wonderful rest of your day and um yeah we'll definitely talk later all right guys talk to you later all right can bye